We left off in the last video talking about the different shapes of the demand curves. And so now we're going to talk about what that means for the marginal revenue curve. Because every firm, no matter how it's structured, wants to set its profit maximizing output where the marginal revenue is equal to the marginal cost. And so that fact is going to be true across the board. What's going to make our difference is how the marginal revenue curve is shaped. So for a perfectly competitive firm, since their demand is perfectly elastic at the market price, that's also their marginal revenue. Remember the marginal revenue is how much extra revenue a firm gets whenever it decides to make one more unit of output. So for a perfectly competitive firm, every time a farmer decides to sell one more ear of corn, he gets in his wallet exactly the price of corn. And this amount doesn't change whether he sells one ear or a thousand ears. Each additional ear is worth in sales what exactly is the market price. But that's not going to be the case for these other firms because they have downward sloping demand every time they decide to sell one more unit not only do they have to lower their price on that unit to induce it to be sold but they have to lower their price on all the previous units so it gets a little trickier so for a monopolistically competitive firm its marginal revenue curve is twice the slope of the market demand curve not market excuse me firm demand curve and that's going to be true no matter what it looks like um, and the reason for this being that there is a trade-off in revenue between increased sales and having to cut your price on all those previous units and so from marginal revenue that is the calculation so what you could do if you wanted to you could come up with an equation for the demand curve for a monopolistically competitive firm. There's plenty of examples in the textbook. And then look at what happens to the marginal revenue or each change in total revenue. And what this will look like is it will have the same intercept as the demand curve, but it will fall twice as fast. Um, the real hard reasoning and proof for that comes from calculus. And so the same goes for the monopoly. Its marginal revenue curve is twice the slope of the demand for the firm, but in this case the demand for the firm is market demand. Because remember, a monopolist is the entire market. Okay. But then for an oligopoly, it depends on game theory. I referenced that in the other video that monopoly is kind of, or oligopoly is kind of like a black box. We don't really know what's happening inside there. All we know is what it looks like at the end of things. And that's going to vary a lot depending on what is happening within the oligopoly structure. So there may be times for an oligopoly where it's worthwhile to cut your price in the short term, even though your competitors will do that in the long term and match your price cut and it ends in this big price war. They don't really like doing it, but after all their advertising efforts have failed them, sometimes that's the only last trick they have to try and make money um, before they're pushed out. Okay. So we can't really draw the oligopoly, but we can draw the monopolistically competitive firm and the monopoly. So in last class, we drew what perfect competition looked like. Um, but we didn't for the others. So let's look at a little graph of the two. Okay. So first looking at a monopolistically competitive firm. For a monopolistically competitive firm, um, they have a relatively elastic demand for their product and again their marginal revenue falls at, half, at twice the rate with the same intercept. This is my very rough sketch. So then if we draw their equilibrium, like I said, it's going to be where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So that's going to tell them what quantity they should make. So whatever this is down here is the quantity they should make. But if they charge this price, 
Then, at that low price, this many will be demanded and they're leaving money on the table. So once they set their quantity, they then go up to the demand curve and they use the demand curve to tell them what price they should sell at. So whatever price this is here is the price that the monopolistically competitive firm is going to use to charge their product based on this intersection between the marginal revenue and marginal cost. So again, the process is they look at the intersection between the marginal revenue and marginal cost, find what quantity that means, then take the quantity and plug it back up to the demand curve, and that tells them what price they should charge for it. Now, over time, if this price does have profits, again, since this allows for entry, people are going to enter the market um, over time, causing the demand for a firm to fall and those shifts are parallel. So in your homework there's a question where you have to look at what happens in the long run with a monopolistically competitive firm. And again since entry is not prohibited for these firms it does indeed cause uh, more firms to enter markets that are profitable and therefore push down demand for each individual um, firm's product over time and they will end up with zero profit in the long run. And again, this happens by the demand curve decreasing parallel over time until it becomes tangent with the average total cost curve. I know that's not in this graph, but it is in the one on your homework. And so then for a monopolistically competitive firm, they're going to do exactly the same thing. Only here you can see I've drawn their demand more elastic because again, this is demand for everything being produced. Right, they're the only ones making whatever product this is. So again, they're going to set their price equal to their, or th not their price, they're going to choose their quantity by looking at where marginal revenue and marginal cost intersect, which is here on this line. And then they take that up again to the demand curve, because if they left it down here, they would end up, sure they would sell out, but there would in fact be a shortage. So they can make more money by plugging it up here at the market price. So they go up to the demand curve to set their price. Now there's a common misconception that many people say about monopolies, and they say that a monopoly can charge any price they want. Again, they cannot choose any price they want. They can choose any price they want on the demand curve. So they can't decide that they want to sell up here at this price, or maybe up here because nobody will buy it. So they're choosing the most profitable price and quantity combination given the demand curve. So again, they cannot change the demand for their product necessarily, or they can't make you demand their product more, but they can charge whatever price and quantity combination they would like on the demand curve. Okay. So back to our table here. The profit maximizing price, again, for a perfectly competitive firm is just whatever the market price is. And for all these other firms, it's the demand price for the quantity produced. And that's going to be the case for all of these. Okay. So even though we can't really look at an oligopoly, but they're still going to want to charge a price that's on their demand curve and is whatever this quantity results in, the corresponding price for it on the demand curve. We just don't know what the marginal revenue curve looks like, so we can't draw it. So for perfect competition, they can have profits in the short run, but they can't in the long run. And the same actually goes for monopolistic competition. And again, this is because in the short run, you can have these profits, but in the long run, Firms can enter because there's low to no barriers to entry, and so new firms will enter. Okay. And for an oligopoly, it is possible to have long-run profits, but these are going to be less than the monopoly profits. And that's for each firm, because here it's multiple firms sharing monopoly profits. And so even if they can push themselves and agree to the monopoly output, they're still splitting it pie multiple ways. So they each get a, lar a smaller slice than a monopoly would if they were the only ones. So here for a monopoly, because of these six 
substantial barriers to entry. No one can come in. And so they're going to make profits as long as they're allowed to exist as a monopoly. So that would be barring no large changes primarily in any type of regulation on the industry. So perfect competition is efficient because it gets us to that output level um, where the marginal benefit of the last unit made is equal to the marginal cost of the last unit made and sold. Uh, but that's not the case with these. So for this equate or this graph here, the efficient place would be to be here. Excuse me. But we aren't getting there, right? We're not producing enough and we're charging too high of a price. And the same goes for a monopolistically competitive firm. Okay. So they're charging, again, not quite the same and we're not getting quite to the same output. Now their price is going to be closer because they have less of a market power, but they're not going to still end up at our optimum or efficient level of production. So all of these are inefficient except for the perfectly competitive firm. However, um, the monopolistically competitive firm is less than the monopoly in its level of inefficiency. Right? So it gets us closer to the that point than a monopoly would because there is some competition but not as close as we would like to be or as we would be with perfect competition. So we talked about some examples in class. Um, for perfect competition we discussed farmers and gas stations. Okay. For monopolistic competi competition several examples are Starbucks and Mattel. So they're not the only ones making coffee and toys, but they are main ones, and they come to mind whenever you think of those industries. Again, a monopolistically competitive industry is one where the brand name means something, and so it can justify a decent advertising budget. Um, also, these are going to be ones where you can think of a lot of the producers, but maybe not all of them. Whereas for an oligopoly, you can think of all of the major producers. So this is something like airlines, specifically for U.S. domestic flights. Right? There's only a certain number of airlines that go from one place to another place, specifically within the U.S. And if it's a flight that you are familiar with, you can probably list the, all the airlines that will get you from one place to another. And then for monopolies, ones that exist in the U.S. are things like electricity firms, Right, so when you moved into your house or your apartment, you weren't asked who you would like to be your electrical provider. It was told to you who would be your electrical provider. And that's because there's only one option. It's not like cable or um, cable versus dish. You have multiple ways you can view television, but you only have one way to get electricity. Also, this fits with some pharmaceuticals. So these pharmaceuticals, again, they're drugs that you have no alternative to, um, especially when they're first created. And there are reasons that we might want to protect them, and we'll talk about that during next week with the natural monopoly uh, section. So I hope this helps you fill out your tables and you're able to complete the homework. Please let me know if you have any other questions and there's something that's not clear between these videos that I've posted as well as the ones from Khan Academy.